Let's stand. Honor God as I speak from his word found in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Holy Spirit, you are our helper always, always, always. Thank you for helping us now. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Here's a quote from Kelly Miller. I see that the path of progress has never taken a straight line, but has always been a zigzag course amid the conflicting forces of right and wrong, truth and error, justice and injustice, cruelty and mercy. Kelly Miller, um, quite an extraordinary leader. Um, Among many things, he was a mathematician had multiple degrees, was at Howard University as the uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences. He was the first African-American student at Johns Hopkins University. And that was his quote, zigzag course. Do you ever feel like your life is zigzagging? It's interesting because Kelly Miller is a mathematician, and if you've had math, particularly geometry, you are taught that The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And yet you have this mathematician saying the pathway to progress is never a straight line. I agree with him emphatically. Your life, my life, our life, it's never a straight line. Never a straight line. And and it seems to me that we are continuously engaged in the effort of straightening out our life of straightening things out in our life, only to find that they keep zigzagging, that we're in this life that is continuously zigzagging while we're continuously trying to straighten things out, trying to straighten out your finances. Anybody? Trying to straighten out your marriage. Anybody? Trying to straighten out your grades, trying to get straight A's. If not straight B's, straight C's, we don't want straight D's and straight F's. I've done that before. I had a 4.5 GPA, 0.45 GPA. (laughs) Yes. For those who are visiting, I went back. I got 3.8, 3.9, graduated. But we're always trying to straighten out our lives. And yet they keep zigzagging constantly. And it's so wonderful to come to the recognition that David is expressing in Psalm 23. And that is, God is good. God is loving. God is merciful. Like, God is not only good, loving, and merciful, but God is good to us. God loves us. God is merciful to us. And while we are engaged continuously trying to straighten out our lives, God is actually continually stretching us out and sending us out. So we can keep trying to straighten things out, but God will continue to stretch us out and send us out. And the expression of God's goodness and mercy that follows us all the days of our life shows up in three ways. God's protection. It's number one. God's protection. Uh, God's protection. How do we see God's protection? I'll just give all three and then we'll talk about it. God's protection. God's uh, correction and God's direction. Those three things are expression of God's goodness and mercy toward us. And David's writing about it as we open up Psalm 23. Break down the film, if you will. 
God's protection. We hear that when David says, even though I walk through the darkest valley. I'll say it for some of you whose brains like, please, please. Even though I walk through the shadow of death. I know King James folks in here. Even though I walk through the darkest valley or the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. You're with me. Protection. God's correction. Your rod says it all right there. He disciplines those he loves. And then your direction, your staff, always pointing the way ahead. David, it's, it's packaged in there, and it's easy to read over, but it's all there. And when David writes this, we need to understand that he is not the first to express a heart toward God being a shepherd. This is ancient. He wrote Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, but he can't take credit for it. He's like that boy in the kitchen, and your grandma's in there stirring up the pot. Boy, she don't call you boy. She said, boy, and she's making black eyed peas, and she looks at you and goes, boy, and you grow up and become some famous PhD person, but you know it was your grandmama who said it to you when you were five years old in the kitchen, but now you got a doctorate degree about something your grandma, who had a third grade education, taught you. Is that anybody's grandma in here? I see you on the back row. I see that hand. How many things have we learned from the generations who went before us? David is actually a shepherd himself. He's a shepherd of actual sheep who then becomes a shepherd of people. God always lets you test with something uh, first before you work it out on people because he knows you're going to make a mess with this and you're going to make a mess with people, but hopefully you won't make as much mess with people because you've messed up so much here, but even there he still has to correct you and direct you. So David is writing, the Lord is my shepherd, but you'd have to go all the way back to the beginning, to the very first man, to the very first woman, which is married at first sight, Adam and Eve, who had the first children, sons and daughters, and they had two sons, they had Cain and Abel, and Abel was a shepherd. So this is something that the culture, the Israelis, the Hebrew, the Jewish people, they are immersed in what it is to be shepherds. They have the smell of sheep on them. That's what they hear 24-7. We go to petting zoos when we want to see a sheep. They're the zookeepers. So when he's writing anthropomorphically, when he's writing in all these other ways, he's writing out of the experience of a life he's living. And so it was, it was Abel who was a shepherd, but then you come forward, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they were shepherds. Jacob said, God, who's been my shepherd all these days, who's delivered me from all harm. And not only does Jacob talk about God being a shepherd, but he then is, wrestles with God. His name is changed to Israel, and Israel is known as a people who are God's people shepherded by him. But you come on down, and you got Moses, and Moses was actually called to shepherd God's people. Remember that? He led... He he shepherded uh, the, at Midian, the priest of Midian, Jethro. He took care of those sheep, and then he shepherded all of Israel for 40 years in promised land. He didn't go in. You know that story. It's all in Genesis. You go read it. And so you got Moses, and then you got after Moses. You got all these people, and you get down to, to David, shepherd. But it's interesting because all through the Psalms, as David is writing about God and talking about the closeness of relationship, it's important for us to understand that When God wants to bring us near to himself, he does so by coming near to us because he knows we can't find him. The nature of sheep, sheep are nearsighted. They can't see very far. They grow all this wool on them and then they fall over and they can't even get up. It's not very flattering that the Bible likens us who follow God to sheep. It's just not flattering. But it speaks highly about his faithfulness. Because he protects, he corrects, and he directs. And that's his goodness and love toward us. And so when David uses the word, the Lord is my shepherd, imagine what David is saying. David is is expressing something that is near and dear to his own experience. But also, he's using a word to talk about his relationship with God. And it is probably one of the most intimate words that he could use to describe the intimacy of his relationship with God. Which is why the Bible says of him, God himself, he's a man after my own heart. David's a man after my own heart. Because when David describes, he says, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my shield, my God is my rock, my shield, my, y'all remember that one? (laughs) Throwback. Yeah, yeah, there are all kinds of words in the Psalms. David's like, the Lord is my light, the Lord is my rock, my refuge, my God in whom I trust. Yes, he's king. He uses all these terms, but when he speaks of the personal nature, the intimacy of the relationship with God, he uses shepherd. Why? Because a shepherd actually lives with the sheep. Shepherds are close with the sheep. Shepherds got the smell of sheep all over them. Shepherds know the sound of the sheep's voice. Listen, mama's in this room. When their baby is newborn and early on and that baby starts to cry, mama just stops 
Ear goes left, and she knows that that's a cry. I'm hungry, a cry I'm sleepy, I'm crying, I need to be changed. She recognizes the cry. That child can be five years old, and mama can be in a crowd and hear her name or just hear mama. There's a lot of mamas, but when, they, when the mama hears her child say mama, go, that's my baby right there. There's something, and if a woman can do that as a mother, how much more God? God hears your cries. And so he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Again, God does something. When he brings us near to himself, he does so by coming near to us. What do I mean? He steps into everything that is so familiar to us in order to bring awareness to us about who he is and what he is like. Why Jesus in the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God is like this, the kingdom of God is like that. He's using everything that we're familiar with. I was uh, meeting with a coach recently, and we were going through uh, the one-to-one book, which many of you know about. And so he was reading the verse where Jesus says to two people who are going to become his disciples, actually three, uh, they're all four. It's all by the seashore. And Jesus says to them after this miraculous catch. So he shows up at their job. They're not just fishing. This is not just fly fishing, vacation hobby. This is their livelihood. This is commerce. This is how they provide for the community and for their family. So this is what they have done day in, day out for all their lives. You know how much time we spend at work? They are spending time at work like that. So they know all that there is to know about fishing. So Jesus, in order to bring these men near to him, comes near to them by stepping into what is familiar with them, and they have the best day of their life in terms of their business. What's that show? Greatest Cats? This should be on TV. This was the greatest catch. They didn't even have the equipment, the boats, or the nets for the catch. Jesus said, drop the net on the other side. Boom! How you like me now? They caught more fish. And I'm telling you, at the end of that day, you're like, oh, can, you, can we hire you? Would you like to be a part of our business? You're like, no, 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 no. He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And I asked the coach, I said, why do you think he said fishers of men? Like, I don't know. And I said, what do you think their industry profession was? He said, were they fishermen? Yes. And I said, so what would he say to you if Jesus showed up and wanted you to follow him? He would say, follow me and I'll make you coaches of men. Woo! (laughs) Do you get it? No, you don't get it. You need nothing. If any accountants in the room, where are my accountants? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. CPAs, accountant, hold your hands up. Accountant, where are the accountants? They're, yeah, the accountants are putting their hands on their forehead. They're just so, that's the C in them, really conservative, very, you know. So if an accountant, my wife, if, the, if an accountant is there and Jesus shows up for the accountant, Jesus walks up to the accountant and says to the accountant, follow me and I will make you reconcilers of men and women. You will, at the end of the day in people's lives, help them come to the place where nothing is missing, nothing is lost, everything is accounted for. You hear the gospel in that? Yeah. That's, do you understand? Just shell out your profession. Yell it out. Teacher. What else? Pastor, Pastor right? <laughs> y'all quiet today, man. Y'all just quiet. Are y'all employed? Do we need to stop? Lord, pray that <laughs> our people have jobs. Lord, bless them with jobs. <laughs> Who's not employed? Who needs a job? You, you, you need some food? We got you. We go, you need, yeah. College student, raise his hand. Yeah. College students in his church who become young professionals gave 32,000 euros toward their building. Students, 10 students. They have jobs now. They have jobs now. Been with them since students graduated, stayed. Our life is often zigzagging. Just zigzagging all over the place. We're trying to make it a straight line, and God is like, I'm zigzagging. We were talking this morning before the service, and I was just thinking to myself, man, your life has been zigzagging your whole life. He, born in Korea, lived there for 10 years. Parents are missionaries, moved to Argentina, lived in Argentina for 10 years. So now he's in Argentina for 10, 11 years, then moves back to Korea, then from Korea goes to France, right? Did I get it right? And is in France now for the last 25 years, right? Good looking brother. You do the math, like you, how old are you? So anyway, the whole idea is that he's been trying to straighten his life out, but God has been zigzagging him all the way to these places. I need you to learn this language. I've got to immerse you in this culture. So in his church, he has Francophone people from Africa, West Africa, Togo. He has people who are, who are Latin American, speaking Spanish, speaking English. English is his worst language. My God, it just four languages, but you begin to realize that all of the 
zigzagging, the sharp turns in life and the ups and downs and the ins and outs and the pain and the shame and the joy and the sorrow is all God zigzagging, but you don't have to worry about the zigzagging. He's actually using all the zigzagging in your life. You don't need to straighten it out because you have his protection, you have his correction, and you have his direction. It was a manifestation of his love, of his kindness, of his goodness, and his mercy that follows you every day of your life. We're so, we're so fixated on straightening our life out and God says let it zigzag because I'm in control freedom is knowing that God's in control when your life seems like it's zigzagging out of control God protects Jesus says this in John 10 he says I'm the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down love it now we're not talking about just sheep and shepherds. We're talking about Jesus with us. Jesus says he's the good shepherd. What the good shepherd does is when it is time for the sheep to actually come into the pen, they take their staff and they actually hold it about a yard above the ground. Because when they want to go into the pen, the sheep have to go over the pen. Why do, I mean, jump over the, over the staff. The reason for this is singular. It tells you the health of the sheep. Know well the condition of your flock. Not just know, know well. The eldership of this church, the pastors of this church, the leadership of this church is charged to know well your condition because we are accountable before God. And by the grace of God, we will be what we have not been, but be what he's called us to be as we walk through this season. You hold the rod, and if the sheep comes, they all just jump over it. Bad, bad, bad. They just all jump over it. My imagination, that just plays out like that. But when a sheep comes up to the staff and can't jump over it and just stops, you realize we need to, we need to care for this sheep. Was the leg injured while we were at the green pastures or when we were beside the quiet waters or when we went through the steep valley? Where did you get hurt? But we have to have a checkpoint. And if you can't go over we love you, you're valuable, but we need to make sure we care for you. There's a reason why the sheep can't get over. And it's the shepherd's responsibility to care. God says, I care for my sheep. And then after they're all in, he shuts the, the, the gate, and then you know what he does? He lays down in front of it. Do you understand? Do we understand the nature of God's care? The shepherd doesn't close the pen and then go off to his home. He shuts it and then he sits down in front of it and he goes to sleep in front of it because he's saying, if a wolf comes, not on my watch. That wolf will have to go through me to get to you. And not only do I lay down in front of the pen, I will lay down my life to save you. God's protection in your life is you are so valuable to him that he will lay down his very life for your life. Go ahead and give him praise. Go ahead and give him praise. Somebody ought to be glad. The reason why you're experiencing protection is not because you go chirp, chirp, and lock your door, or you have ADT security. I'm glad you have all that, but the Bible says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen guard in vain. So you can have the top Navy SEALs in the world, the top military Marines, but if God doesn't protect your city, those boys are going to drop. God says, I'm going to watch. I'm going to protect. I'm going to care for you. That's protection. God's correction. Your rod. Now, the rod can be used to fend off wolves and such wild animals. David said, I've rescued lamb, a sheep from the mouth of the bear and the lion. But we're talking about Jesus, not David. And when he rescues him, here's what Jesus says. Correction. If one of you has a hundred sheep and one goes astray, will he not take the 99 and say, y'all stay here? You stay here with the other shepherds. You stay here with the elders. And I'm going after that one. Your life is so valuable to God. It is of inestimable worth that though you live in a society on social media that constantly tries to compare you to images that are non-reality, God says to you, you are of inestimable worth. Women, you are beautiful. Men, you are good looking. You are some of the most beautiful, wonderfully... Mm, Pastor, I don't believe all that. Mm. Psalm 139. 
I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and my soul knows it well. Your soul has to come to the point where you either say, why did God make me like this? Or I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And once you realize you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and that God knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb, you realize how important you are, your worth and your value. It's not tied to your job or your, the number of degrees or how much money you have or any of that. That's not your worth. Your worth was determined from all eternity before you were born. So don't accept any lesser value than who you are. Correction. He restores your soul. He, he, bring, it's, he will bring us back. How many realize you were drifting and God brought you back? Man, my life never draws near God. It drifts. When you're in a river and you just step in a boat, it's just going to drift. You actually have to paddle upstream. But if you don't have the strength, God says, I will bring you back to me. I remember being like 14 years old, 12 years old somewhere, and, you know, Christian, but I don't know what made me pray this way. Lord, if I ever drift from you, please bring me back. I'm so glad I prayed that prayer. He probably would have done it anyway, but I think he moved me to prayer because at 17, I didn't drift. I, like, ran away. I'm like, I ran away from God. I ran away from family. I, I, some of you can attest. I used to say, I know y'all don't know, but y'all do know. I'm, not mis- I'm, I'm deleting that phrase from my preaching. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. You do know what I'm talking about. Ran away from family, ran away from friends, ran away from God, ran away from church, I ran away from law. And God just came because I was the one. Correction. Correction also is not just he brings us back, it's that he keeps us on track. Because you might not be drifted out there backsliding, but how many of you know you can be here and still need to be kept on track? When we send men and women to the moon, first of all, they're not doing it by themselves. There's a whole team. We call them mission control. And when they take off, it's... Mission control. It's checking the uh, stabilizer, uh, looking at the longitude latitude, 0.346745 degrees. Uh, Yeah, Houston. We're good. Uh, You need to shift to the left one degree. Okay. Okay, great. All the way to the moon, they are course correcting. Let me say it again. From Earth to the moon is course correction the entire way. Any astronauts in the room? Where? where? I know that. Who's in here? You're Okay. Astronaut, thank you. Any aeronautical people in the room? NASA folk, you can't tell, you have to kill me if you say, I understand. (laughs) The whole way is course correcting. The Bible says correction is a way of life. So sometimes in our hearts, we can miss the moment that, well, I got born again, I'm good. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That's the liftoff. I'm born again, I got born again 30 years ago. Yeah, I can't tell where you are right now though. Because you've not yet submitted to correction which is part of God's goodness and mercy to make sure you don't miss the mile, miss the moon by hundreds and thousands of miles. I got this. Okay, let, let's see how you get there. You all out of fuel, can't find the moon, lost, trying to figure why your life is all jacked up because you ignored course correction and you regarded your counsel above all others. The Bible says you see a man or woman who's wise in their own eyes, there's actually more hope for a fool. Whose counsel do you regard above your own? If the answer is no one, you're a train wreck about to happen. I keep counsel in my life. Those who lead me, those who lead with me, those I lead. All three. So that's the course correction. He keeps us on track. Aren't you glad God keeps you on track? Course correct. It doesn't feel good. Course correct. That doesn't feel good. Course correct. But it's to make sure you don't miss what God has for you. And then so we have God's protection, we have God, God protects, God corrects, and then what? God directs. You got to know the word. Got to know the word. We memorize scriptures. We, not to say that we can memorize it, but be, you know when you, listen, what's your favorite song? Yell it out. <laughs> the past I can't say that in church. <laughs> what's your favorite song? Say what? Double Dutch bus. Thank you. Somebody else. Favorite song? I mean, we just worship. You could have just picked one of those three. I mean, y'all are, y'all are, y'all are, I don't know what to say. 
whatever your favorite song is, the reason why I'm asking is because you don't have to read the words. You carry that song in such a way that it actually carries you. I'm at the street light just like you, and you look over and somebody is... They can't see anybody in traffic, nobody else is around, but they are jamming because it's their song. Am I right? So when you know the words of a song, you don't have to read the screen. And when you don't have to read the screen, you don't have to just be cerebral. It's actually coming out of your soul, out of your emotions, which is why certain songs I can hear today take me back to the 1980s. In the 80s, the diva was Whitney Houston. So if a Whitney Houston song comes on, it doesn't matter where I am. I'm back at American University. It's just automatic. My thoughts go right back there because it's a mnemonic program. Are you all with me? Well, God intended us to know the word that way, which if you didn't understand, some of the songs, some of the songs in the Bible are written alphabetically. Not our alphabet, but their alphabet. And so it was to help them mnemonically memorize it. Because when the word gets in your head, once you memorize it, it drops 18 inches and get in your heart. When the word is in your heart, it's near you. Now you can live it. You can't live the word if it's written in the Bible. You can only live it when it's written on your heart. But to get it written on your heart, you have to think about it, meditate on it, memorize it, and let it drop down. Once it gets inside of you, when you're living day to day, that word actually starts to come out of you. In conversations, in a meeting, you pause. You're like, Lord, what should I do? And then all of a sudden, the psalm comes to your head. Why? Because you downloaded it. You have something on deposit that the Holy Spirit can bring to the moment. And all of a sudden, you're dropping wisdom in the board meeting. You're like, why, goodness, Matt, where did you get that from? That's going to change our whole trajectory of what we do in the Middle East. Man, oh my goodness, Taryn, how did you know that? That's going to change what we're doing in the school district. Wisdom from God, not wisdom. The wisdom of man is earthly, but the wisdom of God is heavenly, as pure, as peaceable. You don't know the jewels that are yours until you get it downloaded. But once you download the Word of God, it will shape you. It'll shape your business. It'll shape your family. The Word is living and active. It will shape everything you know. And so this is why the Bible says in Psalm 133, show that picture of my candle. The word, the, the lamp, of, help me. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can't see it because it's circular, but that's it. So back then they didn't have all this fluorescent stuff. So when it's dark at night, there's no street lights. You can't see your hand this close. So you have a lantern and you're walking with it. But the throw of the light might be five yards, maybe 10 at the best. We'll call it 10 yards since we know about NFL stuff. So when you are standing here with your lamp, how far can I see? Say what? Can't hear you. Two feet? To your feet, right. So the most illumined areas around my feet, but let's say the throw of the light is five feet for sake of discussion. This is how God tries to direct us. He speaks his word to us, but we're like, oh no, God, I can't see what's behind five feet. And we become immobilized and we don't have faith to walk with God because we're like, I just need to, see. if you could just show me what's behind five feet, then I'll go with you. Problem is once he shows you what's behind five, now you want to see what's behind 10. Then when he showed you 10, you want to see 15. Then he would say, so God doesn't bother to show you more than five feet because he's realizing no matter if I show you the whole deal, you're not going to go because you still have to have faith to go. So I'm trying to stretch you out and send you out. And the only way I can stretch you out and send you out is by getting you to the point where you actually say the word of God, not what I see with my eyes. We walk by, not by. So I don't need to see beyond five feet I, because we walk by which means trusting God. So if God says walk, you take a step. The, most, the, the clearest next move is the one where I'm standing because that's the place that's most illumined. I don't know if I should go to college. I don't know if I should go to the missionary. I don't know if I should. Well, you might do all of it. But if you just take one step, now you can see what was five feet. You have a new five feet, which is six feet. Then he says take another step. Now you can see still five feet, but what was five feet, you can now see seven. And then when you start to walk with God, you realize, oh, I see one, two, three, four, five feet at a time, but I can see the next step. Stop trying to figure out the next 10. Because even if you plan the next 10 years of your life, as one coach told me, I'm trying to control the narrative of my life, your life's going to zigzag so much that you're not even going to be there. Next week, you're going to be over here. Hello? Is this helpful? So, you got to know the word. We did... Psalm 91 back in the day, and we gave t-shirts. Then we told everybody, memorize Psalm 25. I want you to memorize Psalm 25, New International Version. That's your homework. Memorize Psalm 25. 
How many are going to do it? Raise your hand. All right. We're going we're gonna to let people memorize it. You can memorize it in Francophone, English, whatever language you want, but memorize Psalm 25. Our staff has done this. I want the whole church to memorize Psalm 25. It's for your good, not mine, because you're going to see the benefit that you get in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. And then every day you realize, Lord, today I put my trust in you. So you have to do that every day. It can't be that you did it 25 years ago. Are you with me? Okay. It's not enough that you know God's word. Part of his direction is you got to know his voice. Some people know God's word, but they don't necessarily know his voice. And if you know his word, but you don't know his voice, you can't follow his direction the way he desires. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were in the garden. The devil came, tempted. And here's how he tempted. What has God said? The devil has no words of his own. Because Jesus is the word. He has no words of his own. So he has to ask, what has God said? Once he knows what God says, he is a master at twisting the word. So if you don't know the word, the word you know, that you think you know, is actually twisted. And you can't distinguish a lie from the truth. When I watch TV, I'm like, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. And it could be a good show. But the more you know the truth, the more lies become apparent. Um, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. No food, no water. He becomes hungry. And the devil says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now watch how, watch how crafty the devil is. He heard Jesus say, okay, okay, I got you. Man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So watch what he does. He took him up to a high place, the temple, told him, look out over it, everything isn't great. Throw yourself down because it is written. You see what he's doing? He's using what? You see, you can know the word of God, and that's good, but so does the devil, and that doesn't help him. But he will use it against you. So he says, throw yourself down because it says, he quoted Psalm 91. God will command his angels to lift you up in their hands so you don't strike your foot against a stone. Now, if that wasn't Jesus, but anybody else, they'd be like, oh, that is the word of God. Uh. <laughs> and I see people all the time, but God told me, it's in the word. That wasn't his voice. It was his word, but it wasn't his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I'd rather you know his voice than know a million words. I'd rather you know his voice than know, be able to quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but not know his voice. You can't just know his word. God wants you to know his voice. My sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So Jesus is like, man, that's strange right now. You're using my daddy's words against me. And, he, and Jesus is so cool. He's bad. Man, he's a bad brother. Because when the devil quoted, it is written, it is written that he will command his angels uh, to, to lift you up. He command them, charge them to lift you up in their hands so you don't strike your foot against the stone. He could have said, now finish it. You know what comes next? You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample upon the great lion and the serpent. That was a reference to Jesus. Yo, I'm here to trample you, you serpent. I'm here to trample you. I'm going to step on you. I'm going to crush you. He didn't even, he's like, I'm going to finish that verse a little later. I'm going to shout. Y'all leave me. Woo! That's a bad brother. That's the thriller in Manila. That's Jesus going, boom. Throw another punch. Boom. Boom. Matrix out here. <laughs> I mean, when you're ready, you won't have to dodge a bullet because you'll just get back up. It's time to stop. Y'all tired. Y'all tired. Let me end with this. When I say the goodness and mercy of God following you all the days of your life, here's what Moses said because he was a shepherd. One day Moses got to the end of himself. He's like, I can't lead these people beyond this point. Every leader hits moments periodically where you've reached your zenith. Like I'm maxed out. What you've wrought in me, what I've caught, what I've been taught, I'm at my limits. And there's nothing more you can do. This is where you find strength in God. 
During worship this morning, I was so encouraged because I recognized that we as a people were finding our strength in God this morning. God graciously loves, he, he graciously cares for, he's merciful, he's loving and, and to us, and he does so in such a way that we who are weak, we who are broken, we who are, who are upset, who are worried, who are frazzled, find our strength in him. And I'm going to pray, and we're going to be done. But Moses said to God one day when he was at the end of his abilities, anybody ever come to the end of their abilities? I am at the end of my ability as a leader right now. Right now, I, I have reached the end of my leadership ability. And so this is where God gives you an upgrade. Upgrade in authority, upgrade in mercy, upgrade in what you can't get on your own, you have to find it in him. And David was wonderful at finding strength in God. And here's what he says. Moses, not David. He said, God, show me your glory. He didn't want to just see his glory to see his glory. He's like, I need to see something in you that has not yet been formed in me. I need to see something in you that transforms me. I need to find something in you that I cannot find in myself because I can't lead beyond this place. That's what Moses said. You've been telling me to lead these people and do this, but you haven't been telling me who's going to go with me. And if you don't go, I don't want to go because only you can get us where we're supposed to be. Show me your glory. Moses said, I'm not moving. Show me your glory. I've got to see something in God. I've read all the books on being a great man, a great husband, a great father, a great leader. I sat with the best coaches. I've been mentored. I've been developed. But if you don't show me something in you, I cannot be more. And God says, I have so much more for you. Every one of you, God is saying, I have so much more for you. I have so much more for you. I have so much more for you. I have so much more for all of you. Show me your glory. God says, there's a place near me where you can stand on a rock. And I'm going to put you in the cleft of that rock and I'm going to cover it with my hands. And I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to declare my name. I'm going to say my name. But you can't see my face because no man can see my face and live. But when I pass by you, I'm going to remove my hand and then you'll see me from my backside. Bishop Brett says when God let Moses see the backside, that's how he could write all the history from Genesis up that he had not lived to see. He saw how creation happened. He saw, he saw it all because Moses wasn't around to record that part of history. God said, I'm going to show you the backside. John, the revelator, God said, I'm going to show you my front. And when Moses is in the cleft of the rock, I would love to be here. It says, and he passed in, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Can you imagine God declaring his name over us? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious. Aren't you glad that his name is slow to anger? Lord, I want to thank you for being compassionate toward us. When we didn't deserve your compassion, you looked on us and you empathized with us and you were compassionate toward us and you were gracious toward us and you were slow to anger. Have you not done anything that merits his anger? And yet day after 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 day, he's slow. Every day he's slow to anger. I can be quick to anger, but not God. He's slow to anger. I've been quick to anger with my wife, quick to anger with my kids, quick to anger with people I lead but then when I see how slow he is to anger with me something changes me and I got to go back to my wife go back to my kids go back to the people I lead say I'm sorry he's changing me and the process of change may not be as fast as you need it but he I've seen something in him that is now changing something in me and I know it's going to show up sooner or later because I want to send you out God is stretching you out and he's sending you out to, to make disciples, train leaders, plant churches. 
Jesus said this. I'm, he said this to the disciples. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Be harmless as serpents. And wise as doves. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sheep among wolves, Jesus? Sheep? No, you, you said a line if a wolf is out there. Jesus, that's counterintuitive. Like, if, if, if there is a pit bull, all right, get him, sheep. No, no. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And then he tells us to be wise, like serpents, serpents, but harmless like the Harmless? So you want me to be with the wolves and be harmless? Why? He says, because I am with you. When that sheep starts walking up to the wolf, the wolf starts backing away. Because Jesus is walking right behind the sheep with his staff saying, I dare you. So sheep go, I think that's a bad idea. (laughs) But God goes, no, I am with you. I am with you. Father, I thank you that this morning we're finding our strength in you. If you need to find strength in God, just stand on your feet. Wherever you are zigzagging in life, Whatever problems you're trying to straighten out, I'm trying to straighten out problems just like you. I'm trying to straighten this one out. Our elders are working. We're trying to straighten this out. Our pastors, we're trying to straighten this out. And I realized, oh, we just zigzagging. (laughs) But you're going to protect us. You're going to correct us. And you're going to direct us because that's what good God does. God, we thank you for your goodness this morning. We thank you for your mercy this morning. Surely your goodness and mercy... Your goodness and your steadfast covenantal love will follow us every day of our lives. Put that last image up on the screen. Every day God thinks of you. Every hour God looks after you. Every minute God cares for you because every second he loves you. Lord, I pray this blessing over this house. Just take a moment. Quiet yourself before the Lord. Listen to him. Listen for his voice. anybody in this room who does not know you bring them back today anybody watching online bring them back lovingly correct us and bring us back to you if that's you just say Lord bring me back bring me back I'm sorry for drifting thank you for bringing me back for anybody in this room he, he just he keeps us on track say Lord thank you for getting me back on track thank you for keeping me on track course correcting me all the way thank you for your protection thank you for your correction thank you for your direction all of it is an expression of your goodness your mercy and your love amen let's thank god